visual terms for. Uh, I would like now to invite Professor Anthony uh, Hatzimoisis, who is an Associate Professor of Philology at the University of Athens and regular visiting fellow in epistemology at Manchester Business School. He has held course at the University College London, UCL, the University of Manchester and MIT. He is co-founder of the European Philosophical Society for the Study of Emotions, based at Basel, uh, Switzerland. And his main works include Philosophy and the Emotions by Cambridge University Press, Self-Knowledge by Oxford University Press, and The Philosophy of Sack uh, by Rutledge. His today's theme bears the title, The Paradox, Shame, or Yours. Thank you. I'm uh, honored by the invitation and I'm um, grateful to our host, the Acropolis Museum. Saying feels like a burning sensation that is somehow connected to a sudden sense of insignificance and loss of control. Its emotion engages with the world in a distinct manner. Sadness is a sensitivity to loss. Fear is a response to a threat to what we hold dear or valuable. But what about shame? What may be the focus of a shameful experience? And how is its object the value? The object of shame, that to which we focus when we feel ashamed, is our own self. And the way our self is evaluated in a simple experience is clearly negative. As negative, the experience of shame should be something avoidable. And thus we encounter a paradox that I will try to address today. The experience of shame is something deeply unpleasant, and it is thus desirable that it is avoided. Yet we think very low of someone who is unable to feel shame. As I'll explore this issue with reference to some extracts from the Homeric poems, my choice of the Homeric narrative for the discussion of shame is grounded on several reasons. I'm interested, as a philosopher, in the analysis of the concept of shame. But shame, like love, is not satisfied with being analyzed. It also wants to tell its own story. It needs to be narrated. A narrative is something more than just a bare list of a sequence of events. It is a representation of those events which is shaped and organized, presenting those events from a certain perspective, thereby giving structure to what is narrated. Emotional experience, in contrast to sneezing or a major reflex, have themselves a temporarily extended structure. Some run like a thread that is weaved through the fabric of our life. The ancient Greeks were deeply aware of the temporal dimension of our passions and they focused a lot, some might say too much, on the vulnerability of our emotional life, on the fact that the thread that connects us to the rest of the community or to different stages of ourselves through time might be cut off due to factors we cannot fully control. One of the things that the ancients desired to control was their self image The Iliad provides some fine examples of how one's concern for reputation leads to one's risky engagement with faithful activities whose abandonment would be considered shameful. While the Odyssey illuminates the subtle connections between homecoming and restoring one's status in a way that drives away dishonor. And all these generate occasions where shame comes into play. So, let us start with a rough account of shame. We may think of it as the unpleasant awareness of a quality or a piece of behavior which reflects the subject's inability to meet the standards set by his own values. That definition, though reasonable, faces a problem. People sometimes, in certain contexts, might get to feel ashamed, say, for their natural accent or their skin color, even though when prompted, they will sincerely deny that there's anything wrong with their mother tongue or their place of origin. Perhaps we might be bored. 
it is not rational for such people to feel as if of any of those things. Yet, the fact that the feeling is not rational does not mean that it's not real. Calling something irrational does not let you off the hook. You still need to make sense of why it happens. To elaborate on this puzzling phenomenon, we may take a cue from Aristotle's observation that the same is an emotion that might arise from situations which are not necessarily of our own making. What matters in such cases is that one is deprived of something appropriate to oneself, not whether one should be held accountable for what one is lacking. It is not hard to imagine situations in which we realize that we do not have what it is thought that we should have. And because of that lack, we feel a sense of inadequacy that has not always to do with our misconduct. We can be ashamed of not having a nice home or of not having been considered for honors and awards. If for reasons related to accidental circumstances, such as poverty or cultural bias, no one found it necessary to give us a proper education, it is not our fault if, with our peers, we are now unable to enjoy certain kinds of conversation. And it is understandable that we may feel in that situation as painfully inadequate and shameful. Hence, we are faced with a puzzle. How is it possible to feel ashamed for failing to live up to expectations of appearance or ancestry or behavior, expectations which might be unreasonable to be addressed to us, or that we ourselves in our good moments do not endorse? The answer to that question brings to the fore a claim that has been maintained by some important scholars of ancient Greek culture. Same, according to that view, is first and foremost a social emotion. The social character of shame is a fundamental assumption of much of our current research into Greek psychology. The assumption entails that all episodes of shame require the presence of an audience. The, that assumption is indeed plausible and appears to account for the wealth of visual metaphors. Hence, the ancient proverb to an ophthalmacy in a shame is in the eyes. The rejecting glance, the condescending look, or reversely, the injunction, take your eyes off me, reveals something about the function of shame that calls for interpretation. Why, though, is the existence of an audience a necessary condition for shame? <coughs> to answer that question, we should appeal to a second assumption which concerns not the mere presence of an audience, but how that audience delivers its verdict. In an episode of shame, the assumption goes, there is a rule that is imposed to the subject from the outside and is experienced by him as a sanction. That assumption, if correct, would express the alleged heteronomy of shame, the supposed fact that shame operates only in cultures which ignore the significance of autonomous agency. I disagree with that approach. I recognize that an episode of shame is in some sense public, but that does not mean that it is morally naive or superficial. In an experience of shame, something deep inside us feels touched and exposed. In order to make sense of what that thing might be, we need to take a step back and reflect for a moment not just about the ancient Greek texts, but about how we read them. We may identify at least two traditional approaches to classical texts, which include the words for saying, evos, eschemi, onidos, and cognators, nemesiton, eskos, estros, etc. The first is a communitarian reading with negative undertones. According to that view, the only source of values in ancient Greek culture is the community as a whole. An individual self, as such, is devoid of it only has the value which other people put on it. Thus, there is no genuine sense of self-worth since considering of oneself independently of the community presupposes an awareness of personal autonomy. However, that awareness depends on an understanding of the separability of persons, or the fact that each one of us is different and responsible for one's achievements or failures. 
none of these notions was available in the Greek culture, and thus, according to that interpretation, the same we encounter in ancient texts is a truncated version of the morally loaded experience of that emotion, which is actually a very recent modern invention. At the other end, we find a communitarian reading, but with a positive slant. According to that alternative reading, ancient values are entirely group-centered, and thus how one assesses oneself in that culture is always necessarily a matter of how the others see oneself. But that is not the drawback, since it fulfills the pedagogical task of making oneself sensitive to the conceptions, expectations, and evaluations of others, thus creating the psychological bond which renders separate beings into mutually attached members of a community. The problem with both approaches, in my view, is that they draw on a one-sided picture of Greek culture. The issue, of course, is quite broad and far exceeds my ability to address it in full. For the purposes of the present discussion, I'll just, so just pick up on a few examples which they bear directly on the phenomenon of same. So, the first example comes from Diomedes' retort to Nestor's injunction to abandon a battle that he is bound to lose. Theomedes recognizes the validity of Nestor's advice, yet he cannot bring himself to follow it. And I quote, But this though comes as a sore vexation to my heart and soul, for one day Hector will say as he speaks among the Trojans. Theomedes was put to flight by me and ran to his ships. That will be his boast, and on that day, may the broad earth gate for me. Tote mechani et reacthon, sanixi gina me katapchi. The locus of the Omidis' motivations lies in his kradin and thimos. It is first and foremost how he himself feels about what the situation calls for, what for him is the right thing to do, and then comes the thought of how his actions might look and judged upon by the other people in the future. The omitted concern for what others might say is serious, but it presupposes a personal image of himself. He has an idea of his own worth, which he hopes others will share, and the prospect of the contrary causes him anxiety. What he cherishes is an image of himself as one who never runs away, and the judgment of others is significant not as a source of that evaluation, but as a corroboration by supporting witnesses that he was indeed right to feel that if he runs from the battle, it will not be others but his own self that he will be letting down. It is also worth noting here that the witness that really matters to the Omidis, the one he truly respects, is Hector, his enemy. The second example comes from the emotionally charged exchange between Hector and Andromache. At first reading, the invocation of saying is to enliven in, in Hector a concern for his family, thus inhibiting a course of action which involves risking his own life. Yet, the text offers something more subtle, and I quote. Lady, said Hector. I'm too concerned, but if I hid from the fighting like a coward, I will be seen before all the Trojans, Trojans and their wives and their trailing robes. And my soul won't let me. Deep in my mind and soul, kataphrena ke kataphimon, I know the day is coming when sacred Ilium will fall, but not even that sorrow moves me, as does the thought of your grief when some Greek drags you away, in tears, you, a free woman. The prospective judgment of others again is present, but its function is not to inhibit conduct which Hector would contemplate if he were convinced that he could get away with it. Indeed, instead, the community's judgment reinforces and expresses his own rejection of a certain behavior as unthinkable. It is his mind and soul that leads him in the battle, his self-conception of what is valuable and worthy of his identity, and not some externally imposed sanction or a concern for scoring points with other people. Now, we 
we saw how an ancient text, even of the archaic period, appears to pay proper attention to the subtleties of certain experiences of shame. Does this mean that the Greek conception of shame exhausts the modern understanding of that experience? The answer, I believe, is no. Treating ancient Greek terms or emotions as unproblematically expressive of our own experience betrays a lack of appreciation for the historical dimension of emotional understanding, not only of ancient Greeks, but also of our own. It is a well-established methodological fact that our perspective on ancient texts is not neutral. It is the offspring of several different intellectual, epistemological, ethical, and aesthetic traditions. To appreciate the significance of those traditions, we may recall a story about shame that is now part and parcel of our ordinary understanding of shameful experience. A story that needs to be recalled if we are to reflect critically on how we read, or perhaps misread, the references to shame in Greek texts. As it happens, the story is better known in its Greek version, so let me remind you of some relevant sentences, first in Greek and then in English translation. Kaysan ideo gimini ote adam ke gimini aftu ke uk ishimu. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not the same. So ends chapter 2 of Genesis. Chapter 3 narrates the fall and its aftermath. Και δι νύχτισαν οι οφθαλμοί των δύο και έγνωσαν ότι γυμνήσαν και έραψαν φύλας εκείς και επίησαν εαυτοίς περιζώματα. The eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Presumably they made themselves aprons to cover their nakedness because they were now ashamed. The text suggests that Adam and Eve became a saint because they realized they were naked. But what realization was that? They were not created blind, and so they were not seeing their bodies for the first time. The realization that they were naked must have been the realization that they were unclothed, which would have required them to envision the necessity of clothing. But there was no pre-existing culture or fashion beliefs to enforce any norm or dress. What Genesis suggests is that the necessity of clothing was not a cultural invention, but a natural fact, evident to the first people whose eyes were sufficiently open. Or, and this is the tricky bit, this fact was brought about by their eyes being opened. According to Genesis, their eyes were opened when they acquired knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil just didn't just reveal some evil in their nakedness. It must also have put that evil there. What sort of knowledge could do that? The standard heteronomous analysis, the one we already mentioned in addressing the standard readings of Homeric poems, thinks of it as an emotion of community-centered negative self-assessment. According to that analysis, the subject of saying thinks less of himself at the thought of how he is seen by others. The problem is that Adam and Eve did not think of themselves as unattractive, and in any case, saying is more likely to arise in someone who feels too attractive to an observer such as the artist's model who blushes upon catching the last in his eyes. This example might suggest that the knowledge acquired by Adam and Eve was knowledge of sex. What they suddenly came to see, according to that interpretation, were the sexual possibilities of their situation. This interpretation, though, requires the implausible assumption that what God sought to conceal from Adam and Eve in forbidding them to eat from the tree of knowledge was the idea of using the genitals that he himself had given them. I suggest that it makes more sense to suppose that what they didn't think of until the fall was the idea of not having sex. And this knowledge was gained only after having been suggested by the serpent. What 
the serpent put into Eve's ear as an idea, which she and Adam went on to prove in practice, was the idea of disobedience. You don't have to obey. Obey what? The Lord had already urged them, Aksaneste Kepistimeste, to be fruitful and multiply. Further explaining that a man shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. With everything urging them towards sex, Adam and Eve would hardly have associated intercourse with disobedience. But that's just the point. Everything urged them towards sex, so there was indeed something for them to disobey, namely the instinctual demand to indulge. The serpent's suggestion to Adam and Eve, we don't have to obey, implied that they didn't have to obey the injunction to be, fruit, to be fruitful. You don't have to obey could just as well be phrased today as just saying no. To put it differently, the sexual knowledge acquired through eating the apple amounted to the idea of privacy. What if rust to cover after the fall? Is what in Latin we call putenda, in German chantaille, in French uh, partiontes, in English private parts, in classical Greek idea. The genitals became a locus of shame when they became private. And like an individual's private sphere, a theon in ancient Greek is what calls for respect. The advent of privacy would have required, if not the idea of saying no to sex, then at least the idea of saying not here or not now. So the idea of disobeying one's sexual instincts was instrumental in the development of shame through the development of privacy. But that, I think, is a rather good development. The ability to tell the public from the private, the sense that there is a space where no one not the state, not some political or religious authority, not even our peers have constant access. That I did think, I think, is not a bad thing. Note that to a creature that does whatever its instincts demand, there is no space between impulse and action. Because a dog has little control over its impulses, its impulses are legible in its behavior. Whatever it is, it scratches. So its it is are always over, always public. It might be thought that the concern for privacy and control over our instincts may be taken as a distinctive mark of our current conception of shame, as opposed to the ancient Greek preoccupation with the hero's reputation. But that claim would be quite rash. If one supposes that privacy matters of the bed is a recent invention, one might well as well be reminded of the long exchange between Zeus and Hera in Book 14 of the Iliad. And I quote an extract. Meanwhile, Hera reached the summit of the lofty mountain of Ida. Zeus saw her, and instantly his sharp mind was overwhelmed by longing, as in the days when they first found love sleeping together without their parents' knowledge. Zeus calls to Hera to join him. Hera replies that she is off to pacify the conflicting parties. Zeus now responds, Hera, you shall go later, but for now let us taste the joys of love, for never has such desire so gripped and overwhelmed my heart, as this love and sweet desire for you grips me now. Here replies, son of Cronus, what words are these? You indeed may be eager to make love on the heights of Ida in broad daylight, but what if anyone saw us together and told the others? I would be ashamed to rise again and go home. But if you really wish for love, if your heart is set on it, you have that solid bed your dear son Hephaestus built for you. Let us go and lie there, since lovemaking is your wish. Hera responds to Zeus, have no fear. 
no god or man will see us through the golden cloud in which I will find us. And with that retort, Zeus took his wife in his arms. There they lay, veiled by the cloud, lovely and golden. What is interesting, interesting in that extract, I think, is that the prospective saying of being exposed during an intercourse does not reflect a mere sense of decorum, but is somehow weaved into the emotional setting of the scene, adding to the erotic charge of the dialogue, which is released in the meeting of two bodies in a truly divine setting. We may note, however, a crucial difference between the idea of saying in this case and the warrior scenes we encounter later. Here, there is no principle imposed on an agent from the outside, nor a standard that the agent himself endorses, and he is afraid that he is going to betray. Instead, same pertains to a case where the agent behaves in a way that might endanger her studying within a given social sphere, in that case, the society of men and gods. I would claim, therefore, that here's appeal to say invites a different conceptualization. The presence of an imagined audience is invoked as an inhibitory factor toward an activity which, if performed within one's private chambers, is fully acceptable. Leaving behind the idyllic landscape of Mount Ida, let us move to the closing book of the Iliad, where the two aspects of saying, one as a perceived failure to meet the ideals set by one's own values, and the other as a loss of control over one's public image, converts in the most vivid manner. After the death of Patroclus, the conduct of Achilles has become excessive to the point of savagery. It is not only the bewildered King Priam who describes Achilles as atastalos and violent, but after his excess has taken the form of dragging Hector's body, body around the walls of Troy, even the gods begin to worry about his conduct. Apollo is the first to voice concern by complaining of Achilles' lack of sense. Achilles' departure from the space of predictable behavior his persistent refusal to heed the appeals of Eleos, pity, and uh, and those saying, so not only his lack of compassion for Hector, but also a lack of sense for the limits of human conduct. Achilles' behavior is not simply inconsiderate, it is not just beastly, it looks positively absurd or futile. The case of Achilles, I think, throws in sharp relief what is the underlying theme of the ordinary conception of shame. That one who lacks any sense of that emotion may behave in ways that might not be just unpleasant or deprived, but also pointless or demeaning. A wide variety of the experiences of shame make that emotion especially hard to contain in the limits of a single account. There is, though, an underlying theme and a common perception. The theme is that same arises when one's incapacity to meeting the demands of one's own values is painfully exposed. And the idea is that a sameless subject appears not merely as a bad person, but as less of a person. I would like thus to close with a remark about the significance of saying as a reflection of our failure to seize our self-image. In order to make sense and keep track of his life, a person has to engage in a form of self-presentation, displaying behavior that is to an extent intelligible as manifesting a stable and coherent set of motives. Self-presentation thus serves an important function since others cannot engage you in social interaction unless they find your behavior intelligible. Not to be seen as clever or attractive would be socially disadvantageous, but not to be seen as a self-presenting creature would be socially disqualifying. It would place oneself beyond the reach of social intercourse. Threats to our studying as a self-presenting creature are thus a source of deep anxiety and 
anxiety about the threat and loss of that standing is perhaps what is in many occasions constitutive of the emotion of shame. Being capable of feeling shame, though painful, is constitutive characteristic of personhood. Hence, I believe that if we are properly attuned to what is required by the values which are significant for our self-conception, then we should not be a saint for having a sense of saying. Cheers. <laughs>